Please be seated, friends. <clears throat> Good morning. It is just wonderful to gather on such a grand day uh, as uh, God's family here in this place. And uh, if you do happen to be here for the very first time, uh, we really are glad that you're here, and we just think of you as family today. And uh, welcome to those joining us by live stream this morning. And uh, now, Ed, is this your first time? No. Not your first time, but first time in a while. Yes. Well, we're really glad that you're, you're here. Uh, our Minister of Music, Gerald Van Wyck, is away. Uh, you may have already heard that Jerry's uh, father passed away. And his life is being celebrated in Toronto tomorrow. And uh, just not long ago, they gathered together to celebrate his father's 100th birthday just last year. So he lived a ripe old age, and Jerry and Cora are there uh, to celebrate his life. And we're glad that, uh, that you, Ed, are here and available today, and that Jason is uh, directing. Uh, and uh, see, it just takes a lot of people to replace Jerry, doesn't it? <laughs> And uh, I want you to know there's the invitation that is there every week after worship to linger a bit in our church hall, just down through this door. Uh, there's always uh, another welcome there. There is an actual welcome table should you have questions and uh, looking for bits of information. That can be a helpful place to stop at. And there's coffee and tea and always some good conversation uh, to have uh, while you're there. And I'm Reverend Philip Newman, one of the ministers that serves the congregation. My colleague, Reverend Simon Lesur, as well. We bring, uh, both of us bring hellos as well as our entire music team this morning. Uh, there is nursery available, and uh, they love to see little ones uh, four and under, and uh, they're always ready to welcome and take care of the littlest. And you can find that just down the stairs behind our tech booth. And there's Sunday Club for those uh, four and up as well. And uh, you'll be invited out in just a little bit uh, for that. And if it is your first time to Sunday Club, you'll find in the pews just a small, colorful registration card. It's really helpful uh, if you send your child forward with that for their first time. It has some basic safety and identification uh, information on it uh, for the leaders. And uh, just by way of announcements, uh, we continue into our 100th anniversary year. And uh, there are those folk we know uh, who are looking for historical items and opportunities to reflect back. And some of those little things are underway. But if you have an idea of how old photos that you may have uh, might be shared or uh, how a story uh, that you have might be able to let out in a fun way. Uh, please speak with uh, Katie Knopfsager, who is the coordinator of our 100th anniversary team, and uh, she can help maybe link you up with someone else who has a similar interest, and you can work on such a project together. Uh, lots of opportunity for fun throughout uh, the year. Uh, you have read in the bulletin that Reverend Dal McCrindle, who's yet another minister of our congregation, uh, is inviting folks to a what it, the world-renowned passion play in Oberammergau in the year 2020. Uh, Dal just wants you to know that the information evening has been delayed. Correct, Dal? Uh, so the date you'll see in the bulletin is not correct. He's uh, yet awaiting further information. There will be an update. Uh, later about that. We are in a time uh, of the year where we are looking for folks who would like to join in with Stephen Ministry and become part of the second uh, class uh, for whom the training begins in September. And uh, we are talking with a variety of folks, and you may have questions uh, that you'd like to ask, and there will be a couple of our Stephen Ministers uh, in the church hall after worship. Uh, to uh, uh, answer your questions and maybe even tell you a few uh, stories uh, about what it means to them. Uh, Gene Matrick and Kim Logan will be there today uh, just to help you learn a little bit more uh, about uh, Stephen Ministry. And another event coming up is something that Simon would like to share with us, a new opportunity. Good morning. Good morning. 
Um, over, uh, over the last few years, every once in a while, someone uh, comes up with a question and, and, and asks us whether we have resources uh, to help them strengthen their, uh, their relationship. And um, after the big success of Alpha, we decided we're, we're already in a rhythm and a routine. And so starting May 7th, we'll be offering here a program uh, also developed by Alpha called the Marriage Course. And uh, the marriage course is for any, uh, any couple who is in a long-term relationship uh, who is keen to uh, invest in their relationship or strengthen their relationship. So um, this isn't a thing that if you sign up, you have to come in through the back door so people don't think you have issues. Um, this really is uh, an open invitation to, uh, to anyone who's in a long-term relationship who is uh, looking to go deeper in um, in ways of communicating, one of the sessions is around um, identifying and having conversation with each other around um, the other person's love language. How do they most feel loved? And um, d the way that it differs from Alpha is that Alpha, you, you come in and uh, there's a lot of big group discussion. Um, this is a, a, a lot like a date night, and so there, uh, you, you sit, it's tables of two, and so you sit with uh, your partner. There's no big group conversation, so no one will be talking about uh, sharing or airing each other's laundry in public. So that's really great. And um, just note that, uh, yeah, so dinner will be served, and there is uh, child care available uh, for those who might need it. And, uh, and it doesn't matter if you've been together for two years or 72 years. Is that possible? That's possible. 72 years? Yeah, great. <laughs> um, so just know that there's, uh, there's always space for us to grow in, uh, in our relationship. So uh, there is information in the bulletin that starts May 7th. Uh, it's a seven-week series, and we'll, we'll be skipping uh, the long weekend. Um, so please, uh, please prayerfully consider that. Um, now as we, uh, as we go deeper into worship, we light every week uh, the Christ candle as a reminder of Christ's light. Uh, that we bring with us into the world. And um, this week, uh, I got an email from the Bootin family asking if they could light the Christ candle this morning. Um, they are facing, uh, together as a family, a time of uncertainty uh, where they need to turn towards God. Um, where they need to turn towards God and, um, and also to lean in to all of you as their community. Um, as Christine faces upcoming surgery and recovery. And um, so this morning, we would love for you um, to come and light the Christ candle as a reminder that you are not alone. Over the season of Lent, uh, we've been entering into worship through, uh, through media. And so uh, this morning, I invite you once again to, uh, whether you want to engage with the video uh, through its imagery or through its sound, uh, may you allow it to take you deeper into uh, God's presence this morning. Uh, the Lord be with you.
Let's pray. God of steadfast love and mercy, remind us once again that in Jesus Christ, everything has become new. For far too often, things seem as they have always been. Old habits die hard. Difficult situations linger. Failures from our past linger. We look for your promised newness, but cannot see it. Speak to us again of your new creation. Open our eyes to its presence in our lives. Call us forth to claim this newness, that we may be healed and made whole. In the name of the one who taught us to pray, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. And thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. And for thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. to invite the kids who are here this morning on this last Sunday of March break uh, to uh, come to the front so I can pray with you before we head off to uh, Sunday Club. How are you, Maxie? Yeah? Did you, uh, you enjoy one of the Korean uh, treats last week? No? I hear very few people enjoy it. Before we head off, let me, let me pray with you. God, I thank you so much for um, these young lives. God, for the questions that they bring, um, for the hope that they have of a world that um, might be filled with your peace and your love. 
And God, may you continue the good work that you're doing in their lives. And God, in everything that they do, in the ways that they point to your kingdom, may they know that they, they do that surrounded by a community of people who love them and who want to see them thrive. So God, as we head off the Sunday club, uh, may your spirit go before us. And young and old, uh, may you take us deeper into the mysteries of our faith. We ask all of this in Jesus' awesome and holy name. Amen. All right, off we go. service, we'll hear a gospel story that uh, has a, several characters into it. It's a well-known story. Some would think of it as the parable of the prodigal son, but there's many other characters in that story. And as I move through the prayers, uh, there'll be some different viewpoints from those characters speaking through the prayers this morning. Let's pray. We are so delight of God to be able to gather in this place as your family. And as we read through the holy text, we see many dynamics going on within many families. We can encounter just about any and every human emotion that we can possibly imagine. And we are glad to meet the characters, people who live lives much as we live lives, We're experiencing all the, the celebration and the harshness that life uh, can bring. And we think of that younger son in the story from the Gospel of Luke, who went off on his own, who might pray this morning, saying, For, forgive us, Holy One. Help us to come home. Help us to come home to the love and the grace that we have experienced as your children. We are at times filled with shame and grief. We've made a mistake, we have miscalculated, and we're not sure how to get past that, how we might overcome that, how we can undo that. And maybe we can't. And we are bent over in guilt and humility. And so, help us to come home. Forgive us, we pray. And the Father, we discover in that story, I pray to you, saying, Holy One, how, how we long to be gathered together as one family in your love. How we long to put aside the materialism and the power-mongering that divide and diminish us. How we just long more than anything to be in communion with you and with one another, with our loved ones, but even more than that, with those we don't yet know, and even those we may suspect may be on an opposing side, someone who may have done us wrong, someone who may have run far from us. Help us to know how to move beyond that. Show us the way. As an older brother who has been faithful, who has been steadfast, who has followed every request and demand of mom and dad. He might pray, gracious Savior, we've been here all along. And though it's hard for us to accept that your love extends to those who've wasted and squandered, to those who never once followed my advice, 
We do not want to be wasteful in our love and, and thanksgiving. But yet, show us how to be gracious. Show us how to be reckless with that love. Show us, too, how to be humble. Bring us into communion again with our sisters and our brothers. Make us into the family that you designed us to be. It's interesting, God, that in some of the stories that Jesus told that God recorded of the characters who never really quite appear. There's a mom and a wife there somewhere in this gospel. But in this story, she's not taken notice of. And we know that happens far too often. People who just remain invisible unacknowledged. Loving Creator, help us never to overlook your children. In a world that tells full stories without mention of the women who keep things going, help us to tell our story and empower others to do so as well. Gracious one, you created us to be in communion with each other. Help us to rewrite the stories of our lives so that all are heard and all are welcomed, all are given a space to be at home. All can welcome and all are assured of your grace and holy forgiveness. Your embrace, O oh God, is our life and our hope. Receive us when we drift off into recklessness and despair. Receive us when we drift into rebellion and self-righteousness and resentment. God of steadfast mercy and love, remind us once again that in Christ, Everything has become new. For far too often things seem as they've always been. But speak to us of your newness, your new creation, and open our eyes. This morning we invite your presence, but we know that your presence is already there. Your presence of comfort and healing with those who are on our minds. And today we we lift up these people and we pray for Ben, Georgia, Michael, Sue, Celeste, Kaylee, Susan, Jack, Jill, Alistair, Kathleen, Terry, Cora and Jerry, Phil, Alex, Cheryl, Margaret, Josephine, and Christine. May they experience your new creation wherever they are and however that might come to them, wherever they may be on their Lenten journey. We thank you, God, for the grace that embraces them and the grace that holds us Friends, we come to the time where we are able to offer our gifts, which is always a privilege in Christian worship. I was contacted by a woman this week through email who just wanted to remark what amazing care was given to her and her family. And she wondered how she might say thanks that this congregation provided that care at a moment when they were really needing it. She said, I imagine a donation is one way that you'd be grateful. And I said, certainly, that's always a way to keep the care flowing, to ensure that that is always strong here. And she said, that is what I will do. 
And so we give gifts out of many motivations, and sometimes out of thanks for the care that are offered to us or someone that we love. And so we can give in many ways, online, uh, on, as the offering plate passes, however we give. We give with deep caring that God's mission happens here. Let our offerings be received.
Let us pray. Gracious God, help us to assimilate your word and turn it into action. Amen. Our reading this morning is from Luke 15. Uh, now, all the tax collectors and sinners were coming to near to listen to him, and the Pharisees and the scribes were grumbling and saying, This fellow welcomes sinners and eats with them. So he told them this parable. There was a man who had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the property that, is, that will belong to me. So he divided his property between them. A few days later, the younger son gathered all that he had and traveled to a distant country. There he squandered his property, his property in dissolute living. When he had spent everything, a severe famine took place throughout that country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country, who sent him to his fields to feed the pigs. He would gladly have filled himself with the pods that the pigs were eating, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired hands have bread enough and to spare, but here I am, dying of hunger. I will get up and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me like one of your hired hands. So he set off and went to his father. But while he was still far off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion. He ran out and put his arms around him and kissed him. Then the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his slaves, Quickly, bring out a robe, the best one, and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. And get the fatted calf and kill it, and let us eat and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. Now his elder son was in the field, and when he came and approached the house, he heard music and dancing. He called one of the slaves and asked what was going on. He replied, Your brother has come, and your father has killed the fatted calf because he has got him back safe and sound. Then he became angry and refused to go in. His father came out and listened and came out and began to plead with him. But he answered his father, Listen, for all these years I have been working like a slave for you. I have never disobeyed your command, yet you have never given me even a young goat so that I might celebrate with my friends. But when yes. This son of yours came back, who has devoured your property with prostitutes. You killed a fatted calf for him. Then the father said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. But we had to celebrate and rejoice because this brother of yours was dead and has come back to life. He was lost and has been found. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Thank you, Norm, for that reading. A familiar story, I trust, to many. You know, I, I just want to congratulate you for uh, getting dressed and coming to church uh, during the season of Lent. Now, I say I want to congratulate you because in case you missed it, uh, Lent is the season of sin. You know, that's that time when the church for 40 days kind of rubs our noses uh, in our sinful state and forces us to join in confession whether we want to or not. So, welcome to the church. 
and through much of Lent were not permitted to sing terribly joyous songs, uh, nothing that smacks too much of Easter, not yet. Um, so eat your plain oatmeal and drink your cod liver oil, and then some point we'll talk about when you can begin to laugh and have fun again, not during Lent. Now, I really hope I'm overstating Lent. Uh, I know we don't leave here thinking, I hope, I don't want us to leave here thinking that Lent is all about sin and failure and is to be avoided. God knows that there are plenty of things to discourage us in this world already, and we do not need the church to add on to that burden. I, in fact, really hope that we're not that strict as in ages gone past. I hope that we can find that it's helpful to do a little reflecting and in the season of Lent, do a little digging into our identity as God's people to poke around a little bit at our successes and our failures and see what we learn. Discover what message it is that God has for us. Uh, Our theme throughout this Lent is breaking news, uh, good news, and today we add the word rebellion to that. But I hope in it we hear good news, really, because I believe that God holds good news for us. If we have eyes to, uh, to, to see and ears to hear and hearts that are open, And when we do, even in spite of our rebellion, maybe because of it, good news comes to us. Now, my father, who grew up in our local Baptist church, was taught fairly strict guidelines to keep him from uh, straying, from rebelling, he and others. And, of course, one of those very strong teachings was the prohibition on premarital sex, because it was the devil's playground. But my dad often joked with a smirk on his face that he thought the real fear of his uh, Baptist church was that sex might lead to dancing. (laughs) And my father loved to dance, and so he rebelled off. And as we begin to explore, let's just pause in prayer. Oh Lord, may I never lightly presume to to speak your word, nor may we ever lightly presume to hear your word, for in your word is life. Amen. Now, when my sons were young, we undertook a trip to Orlando, Florida, which meant theme parks, Disney, Epcot Center, Universal Studios. It was spring break, lots of people. Little did I know the real adventure was going to be found at the gigantic flea market that we attended on the one day we did not go to a theme park. Well, it was less an adventure and more a heart stopper, at least for me, Dad. Uh, The flea market was larger than anything I had ever seen, uh, and there were more people, I swear, crowded into it than there were in the theme parks. You get the idea, it's just wall-to-wall people. And so instructions were issued, strict instructions. We stick together as family. No one wanders off. If you can't see me, then I can't see you, and I want to see you at all times. And just for extra measure, there's people here that might want to steal you. So stay close. And so we navigate the entrance, and we move down the long first aisle and turn right. I look around and do not see our six-year-old anywhere. Okay, everybody stop. Where's Timothy? Has anybody seen Timothy? And if you've experienced what I'm about to describe, you know it's one of the worst feelings ever. In just a matter of a few seconds, seconds when I thought he was right there with us, my son is gone. I don't mean he'd gone across the aisle to look at a wonderful new toy. I don't mean he'd taken his candy wrapper over to the garbage bin to throw it away. He was gone. He was nowhere in sight. I heard someone uh, describe an experience he had that was similar to mine, and One of the things he said was, it's never pretty when a full man runs, uh, a grown man runs full on. It just worries me. You think somebody is going to get hurt. Well, it sure wasn't pretty, but I could not have cared less when I took off running. 
several additional busloads of people had arrived, so there were even more. And I don't think I knocked anyone down. But there I went. I was zigging and zagging through the crowd, my elbows flying, bumping into people, taking my hand, them, my, their shoulders in my hands, people I didn't know, to get them out of my way. I was frantic, and I did whatever it took because I had been separated from my little boy. And after what seemed like I'd run a marathon, I got to the end of the first aisle, and I found that at least one of the things that had been taught to our son had stuck with him. He was standing there calm. Just standing calmly where we had turned and he had not. And as I ran up out of breath and panting, he gave me one of those, hey dad, where have you been? <laughs> kind of looks. Well, I couldn't holler at him. I could only hug him. We heard Norm share with us this wonderful parable, a parable of Jesus. Uh, that one has been described, uh, in, uh, parables are described in many ways, even though they've been interpreted and taught and preached about over and over again. And one of the things that makes the parables unique is that there's always uh, seems to be something more about it. And Eugene Peterson described parables as being narrative time bombs. Stories Jesus told that pushed and prodded the people who heard them uh, to look more closely at their lives and God. In a book he wrote, John Claypool says, There are distinctive features that characterize parables. And the first is that the images Jesus uses in parables are taken from everyday life. And the second is that parables always have some kind of intriguing plot. And the third is that there's always an element of surprise uh, in each one of them. And Luke sets the stage for the parable Jesus offers when he writes. Now all the tax collectors and the sinners uh, coming near to, were coming near to listen to Jesus. And the Pharisees and the scribes, they were grumbling and they were saying, This fellow welcomes sinners and he even eats with them. So next verse, so Jesus told them this parable. And on the surface, there, that very brief description of who, what, when, where doesn't give us a lot of detail. But on closer look, it actually tells us quite a lot. And what it tells us becomes clearer when Jesus begins to speak. The story has become the most familiar, I think, of the parables. Most often known as the parable of the prodigal son. <clears throat> but some refer to it as, uh, in other ways... Uh, the parable of the prodigal son and his brother, uh, the parable of the faithful older brother and his lazy sibling, uh, the parable of the lost son, or the parable of the prodigal father, or the parable of the absent mother. But whatever you call it, it's another story about rebellion, about being lost, and returning. You know how this one goes. A man has two sons. The youngest decides that he wants uh, the inheritance. Hey, Dad, you know, if you were dead, I would already have my inheritance. But since you're not, uh, could I have it today? And his father gives it to him. And off he goes, spending the money, living high on the hog. And eventually the son blows through the money. He's destitute, hungry, decides to go home and ask his father forgiveness. But before the son even reaches the family home, before he says a word, his father sees him coming. Sees him running up the aisle and literally runs down it to greet him and to embrace him. It's been pointed out that this story may be the only time we see God in a hurry. The father runs meets and kisses his lost son. There's no dialogue, but the father's gifts, oh, and that embrace gives his son all the assurance that he needs. And when the son begins to lament his rebellion against his father, father really isn't interested in that. And instead starts giving instructions uh, to his servants how they're going to help in celebrating this son's homecoming. The son's confession then has nothing to do with the forgiveness his father offers. And as 
Jewish scholar Jamie, uh, Amy Jill Devi, uh, Levine has pointed out, this parable is not about repenting and forgiving. It's a story about a man with a lost son. In Jewish rabbinic literature, there is a similar parable which tells that of a king who had a son, and that son went away from him for 100 days, and the son's friends tried to coax him, return to your father. But the son said, no, I can't do that. And the father then sent word, return as far as you can, and I will come the rest of the way to you. So God says, return to me, and I'll return to you. I will be there to meet you. It's been said that this most wonderful, that the most wonderful word in the Bible is the little word until. You know, a sheep is lost, and the shepherd searches until he finds it. A coin is lost, and a woman cleans and searches the house until the coin is found. Uh, A father waited for his son until he came home. Have you ever thought about how much of our lives revolve around until? As children, I know, I was told you can't have dessert until you clean up your plate. You can't go to university until you finish high school. You cannot have the keys to the car until you have your license. You cannot go through that intersection until the light turns green. Well, some people know that. Until, until, until. But you know it's. It's the untils of the stories that Jesus tells that makes up the essence of the hope that is the Christian faith. Hope that will sustain us as we wander away and as we get lost. Because as we all know, there are many ways to leave God, to become lost, to put distance between ourselves and our God. But as the Apostle Paul reminds us, there is nothing that can ever separate us from the love of God. For I am convinced, Paul wrote, that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor rulers, not things present or things to come, and nothing in all the powers or height or depth, nothing in creation can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. But all of us feel separated or estranged at some point. Maybe from someone else, or from ourselves, or from God. Each of us experiences periods of desperately wanting, needing to be found. Wanting and needing to know that we are loved, that we're accepted, that we are being looked for. Two of my four siblings ran away from home. And to this day, I do not know all the circumstances surrounding their leaving. I lived through the turmoil of my families not knowing the whereabouts or their safety. To me, it felt like a rebellion was going on. And maybe they were righteous in their actions. I don't know. I did not go through that same rebellion. At least I didn't remove myself physically, but I did rebel after I was cut to the core by a family member. And I rebelled by cutting myself off emotionally, which I know I did to protect myself, but I also know I did it to maximize the pain of the other. They would never get to me again. And I built a wall around myself so that no one was going to penetrate that. So whether the rebellion is of our own making and we carefully put it in place, or it's in response to an intolerable set of circumstances. It can be very difficult to remember, much less embrace, what Paul said about the depth of God's love for us. And how life-changing that can be. And we wonder how long God is willing to wait is until ever over Whether it's a six-year-old who disregards the rules and wanders off in a crowd, or a lost sheep or coin, a son who leaves home, a sibling who disappears, you or me, God is willing to wait until. And until is never over. When we forget about God or, or live as if God doesn't exist, God never forgets about us. 
as I was running like a fool that day at the flea market, there was nothing that would have kept me from getting to my son. There was nothing that would have kept that father in the parable, whose son had left home from running foolishly down the road to greet him, pouring his love all over him when he decided to return. There's nothing that has ever or ever will be able to separate us from God. Return as far as you can from the rebellion, and I will come the rest of the way to you. As he told these parables, Jesus used them as a mirror, really, to, for those he was talking to. And that same mirror and the, of those parables is held to us. Reflected in that mirror were the faces of those grumbling at Jesus. Reflected in the mirror are the faces of all of us who rebel or get lost, get separated. What Jesus wanted the Pharisees to see, I think, and what he wants us to see is that these parables aren't about somebody else. They're about us. They're about everyone who hears them. That, Jesus says, is the nature of the God who made us, who loves us, and who desperately looks for us whenever we become separated. And this morning, I want to close with a prayer written by Thomas Merton, a, a thinker and an author I really appreciate, a prayer that I've been able to identify with at times in my life. So let's pray. My Lord God, I have no idea where I am going. I do not see the road ahead of me. And I cannot know for certain where it will end. Nor do I really know myself. Therefore, I will trust in you, always. Though I may seem lost, I will not fear. For you are ever with me. And you will never leave me to face my perils. Hello. Amen. Simon, feel free to come on and join me at the table. This is the table, I think, where God says, bring your rebellion right here. Lay it out and walk away from it. Because I am here to welcome you and everyone. For this is not a table for a select few privileged people who have found the perfect way to live in faith. Not at all. It is for everyone. This is not a table of this congregation. It's not my table. It's not Simon's table. It is the table of our Lord. And we believe everyone is welcome here who wishes to be strengthened in their life. And so, this is a place to gather, a place to discover healing and hope for your life. I invite you to share with me in this invitation. Enter more deeply into Lent. There are learnings that our God has in mind for us. We come to this table open and ready to embrace life. The peace of Christ be with you. Friends, let's stand and share that same peace with those around us.
share with me in our communion prayer? We are not alone. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Give our thanks and grace. Let us pray. Loving God, a fragrance of yeast arose in the baking of this bread. A warm fragrance of life-giving blessing. And a sweet smell of ripeness rises from this cup. A refreshing invitation to drink deeply of life's goodness. As we gather at this table, help us to discern your presence in these gifts. Help us to be among the people who cherish every day and honor it with our gratitude. As we prepare to break this bread, remind us again of the love of Christ, who knelt at the feet of his disciples, just as Mary knelt at his to wash, to anoint, to bless, and to cherish. And this bread, broken, help us to encounter the embodiment of your cherishing love for all of us. And in this cup poured, show us again the renewing forgiveness that pours over our spirits in sweet understanding. As we continue our journey through Lent, in this meal may we be nourished with strength and wisdom and a deeper willingness to enter the depths and be transformed by your grace. And God, help us not only to encounter you at this table, you who hold us in our brokenness and in our rebellion, and will embrace us in our healing. But here may we also know that you encounter us. We are fully known, understood, embraced, and blessed, and made new. As the tangy fragrance of yeast rises to meet our eternal hungers, and the juicy sweetness of fruit meets our thirsts. May we experience your gentle welcome and be renewed here. Amen. I would invite those who are helping to serve to gather at the foot of the steps.
patients across the front and you're welcome to follow the choir using the center aisle to come forward beginning with the last row once the choir has completed and then make your way back to your seat using the outer aisles. Uh, those seated in the chancel, I mean in the uh, chapel, will be served there. Anyone else who's unable to or wishes not to move forward, we do have a couple of mobile stations. Just wave to them, they'll come up the, uh, from the back, just give them a hand wave and they will come and serve you. They also have gluten free for you as well. These are the gifts of God all ready for you, the people of God.
Please join with me in the response of prayer. I thank you, O Christ, for this feast of life. We are sent forth strengthened to continue the Lenten journey that God has placed before us. We are commissioned to feed as we have been fed, forgiven as we've been forgiven, love as we've been loved. Amen. Friends, this is the place to come with your rebellion, to deal with your separation, because God runs to you when you can go no further. God takes those steps to scoop you up and embrace you. You are God's. And in this week ahead, may you go forward to live life acknowledging that very fact, that you are God's. And may you see the face of Christ in the people you meet, May the people you meet recognize the face of Christ in you.